So welcome to this uh, introductory to Floriani software. Um, when you first turn on your software, you're going to see this um, welcome screen. And this is very, very similar to Perfect Embroidery Pro as well. Um, many of us will um, go up to this, um, this little X and clear out of here and then continue to do some work. But I just want you to be aware there are some very useful tools and links here. Uh, for instance, if you wanted to go and get um, the complementary designs that both Pep and Floriani provide every month, uh, this is where you would want to be. And you would go into your Floriani Club. And uh, in your Floriani Club, you're going to be putting in your, your email and your password. You'll sign in. And what you're going to be looking for is to uh, get your monthly designs and projects. Uh, so when you click on this, it's going to say um, uh, install the current month designs and that's what you're going to want to do. Now, if you happen to miss a month, let's just say that this is April and you forgot about March. Uh, it's happened and it will happen. Um, you can still get the, um, the prior month that has already passed by installing all designs, but this will take everything that Floriani put out and reinstall it for you. I do believe you're going to get duplicates, so just be aware of that. Um, they do have little projects. This is kind of a clever project with uh, embroidering with organza, and we might do that for a future club. But there's a lot of useful information here, so my uh, recommendation is uh, do visit this page from time to time. I'm going to go ahead and uh, X out of this. This, by the way, would be your internet browser, which is automatically opened when you click on that link. We're back in our software, and you could create a new design, open a design, open recently used designs. Um, uh, your help, when you click on this, this is going to bring you into your manual, which is what this is. It's the online manual. And you could go under contents and you could find various topics, like I say, adjusting the workspace, which we'll cover a little bit, showing and hiding toolbars. And you will see that um, you have um, information here to read. Do be aware that uh, I am recording this on a 4K monitor. If you're using um, these newer 4K monitors, some of the um, verbiage can be a little on the small size. I do appreciate Floriani and Pep for being um, Johnny on the spot there as far as updating their software to so that the GUI, the, the graphic user interface, uh, works much better uh, with the 4K monitor. So kudos to them. If you uh, have closed out of that screen, which uh, I just did, you can simply get it again by going up to Help and then going to My Floriani Today, and that will bring up that uh, as well. So uh, we're going to go ahead and create a new design, which brings all of the tools uh, up to bear. Um, there is a, um, the current update, or the current version of this software is uh, going to be version 3230, 3230. And that was just um, updated um, oh, about two weeks back. Uh, when you're watching this video, yours could be, um, how to say, um, out of date if you're at 3230. So how do you check to see if your software is up to date? Well, um, just as I did here, let me just say, okay, I'm going to go back up here, help and about. I'm going to take note 3230. And then what I want to do is go help, check for updates. This brings you to the Floriani site where it'll say this is the current version, 3230. It was brought out on February 14th. And if you needed that version, uh, you could click here and uh, it would um, show that there is a update ready for you to go. So um, that's a, a nice feature. So we're back into the software once again. Um, just so that you're aware, if I'm showing things in PEP, uh, because this is a dual club, um, note that the PEP interface is a teal color, uh, the backspace, and I'm going to delete this out of here because we don't need to see that now. Um, and there will be times where I'll go into the PEP when there are things that are important to, uh, to point out, but for the most part the tools are the same. So back into PEP. 
as with, with most softwares out there now, you still have this menu bar up here. And if I click on, say, File, I get all these various things that I could do, such as opening a design or bringing in artwork. Remember, when we're talking about artwork in um, the software, we're really talking about vector images. Uh, we could also uh, bring in uh, load backdrops, which are generally your raster images. Um, you could get things off of a scanner, for instance. Uh, this is um, a nice feature. This was in the last update of the Floriani, which is called um, You Design It, uh, which is um, this little guy up here. And uh, You Design It, there's a collection of, we're going to say for argument's sake, it's about eight different collections. Uh, and it's kind of like a Mr. Potato Head concept where you can bring bodies and heads and arms and legs and create a little design. I might show you a little of that uh, in uh, this uh, tutorial. It just depends on how long things go. Um, so we'll click off of here. Note that many of the things you see in the menu bars are the most common things are reflected on the icons here in these um, in these menus, these these toolbars, if you will. So just as I can go file open, I could also simply take this uh, open icon here. And when I click on the open icon, it's going to bring me to the very last place that I that I was. And if I wanted to um, navigate to a different folder, such as on my PC, I might want to go to um, let me see in documents. And I could go into things like, um, let's see, is there anything in embroidery designs? Um, and this is, these are like some embroidery designs that, you know, you could bring into the software, for instance. If it's a um, embroidery design that is in your software via that download process that we were just uh, mentioning, Note that yours will be in the library. This library is specific for uh, Floriani. So when you download your monthly designs, as you can see your free monthly designs, you hit the plus sign, it's going to take you to each month of the calendar year. And if you click on, say, uh, we are in um, currently March as I'm recording this. So when I go into March, you're going to see I've got the years 2010 through 2017. So. I have everything current up to date. Uh, if you look at, say, April, which has not occurred yet, you're going to see it just goes to 2016, understandably so, uh, since they have not been downloaded at this point. You can also see that we have uh, free projects, and some of our clubs might be based on these projects, uh, and that's where you would find things like the, um, like the PDFs and things that, um, uh, that, that you would print out for the clubs. So, love that. Um, there is, by the way, a um, software program uh, called My uh, My Design Album. Let me see if I can grab this for us real quick. I'm just going to minimize um, both my uh, Pep and my Floriani. And let me go up to, uh, let's see, Floriani My Design Album. My Design Album, MDA is what it's um, abbreviated at. And the thing I love about this software is it's a cataloging software where you will see um, icons of each of your um, embroidery designs depending on where they are. It'll show you, for instance, the location of them, the size, the number of stitches, the color changes. It'll name the colors for you. Uh, you can put things in by keywords. Um, you can even, if you have, like, say, vector artwork, um, depending on uh, what you have in here, you could absolutely import different things, and it will be there for future references, which uh, which is nice. I'll do a class on, on this software. It's, uh, it's an interesting uh, catalog system. So if I was saying, uh, if I had a collection of uh, flowers, for instance, I could have a specific folder for flowers and it would show me all the flowers that exist on my system, not necessarily in the Floriani My Free Design monthly folder that we just saw. So let me go ahead and bring up Floriani once again. Um, let's go ahead and we're going to open up a design. And so uh, when I go File, uh, Open, uh, I'll go ahead and grab 
this guy here, which is a flower of some sort. And you'll see that uh, the design is up on your screen. And when you click on it, uh, it will, this is not a grouped design. So you can see I can select parts of it. If I wanted everything, you would hit Control A. That selects everything. And this is fairly new to the uh, software. There are the selection handles, which we've had before. This is how I would resize things, say if I wanted to make it wider or if I wanted to make it taller. See how the arrow changes when it's active? That's okay. If I wanted to proportionately change the size, I could do that too. If I wanted to rotate, watch the cursor. When I get over to that circle, that blue circle, do you see how the cursor changes? This is how I would rotate. And so um, there's additional tools in here, which are kind of interesting. Um, this would close the design. This would, if it was, um, say an open object and I wanted to make it a closed object, I could click on this and it would automatically close it for me. This would um, cause the software to zoom in so that it fits the screen. I'm going to back out just a bit. This would uh, copy the object. So if you notice up here, this is my copy icon. This is my paste icon. If I'm at my paste icon, do you see how it's grayed out relative to the copy icon? It's because nothing's on the clipboard. So I could certainly have it selected, go up here and hit copy, but watch this. I have it selected. I'm gonna come down here, and when I click on that, that now that has copied it and pasted it. So do you see how both of these are now active? So this is kind of a one-shot deal uh, where I can copy and paste with a single click of the icon. And there you see it, I just did it again. This would be how I could group the item. So if you may recall when I was initially um, clicking on things, and let me just show again, you'll see how pieces, single objects are being selected here, not the whole item. For me to get the whole item, I can certainly come here and draw a selection box so it encompasses the item. And then if I come down to this icon and say group, now when I click off and click on, do you see how it's, it's grouped, it's one object. So I like these little, they're, they're kind of um, a quick way to get at very commonly used items. Notice also that when I am um, selecting things. I have information up here. And currently this is telling me the, the name of the file that I have here. It's telling me what kind of fabric or the, that it's going to be stitching on. Uh, the style's normal. The number of stitches, the number of color changes, the width, and the height, both in inches. If I wanted to change from from metric to imperial or inches or vice versa. The way I would do this is I would go up to the ruler and if I right click on the ruler, I now have the opportunity to tell the software to work in metric. And as you can see up here, the dimensions have now been updated with the metric equivalents. I'm gonna go ahead and select these last couple of items and let me delete those. And so this is all that's left here. I could certainly, if I wanted to center this, I could certainly click and drag. Do you see how, how when I do this, watch the cursor. Do you see how it turns to a hand, like there's a hand? No, yes, no, yes. So once I have a hand, that means I can click and drag this to a new position on the screen. I could also, if I wanted to center that, go up to this icon here, which means center uh, align this to the um, uh, align this to the to the ruler center to the to the rulers which would be here and you could see how that brings it to the center so let, let me just be clear on that I'm going to put it off center I'm going to come up here which this is the icon for the align tools 
So if I had more than one object, these would be active, but there's just the one object. I'm going to come over here, which means align this to the rulers, and you can see how the origin is now 0, 0. It's in the center. As I'm coming further down here, let's just, uh, this of course is your undo and your redo. This would be of course cut, so we've got cut, copy, paste. This is to send this to the printer. And this is um, uh, one of the benefits of course of having a um, embroidery software program is um, when we send things to the printer, it allows me to print it real size. Let me kind of zoom in here. But most importantly, it also gives me these center uh, markings so that when I'm making templates to position this, I can absolutely um, get it where I want it to be. I teach a class called Perfect Embroidery Placement, and we go into this in much more detail. Uh, there's maybe a couple of pages here, so when I click on the next page, this is showing me what it looks like in the hoop that had been selected. When I click on the next page, this is going to now show me the colors of the uh, design. And uh, under settings, settings, this will give me my margins for the page. This is going to show me what kind of things do I want to see in my printout. So do I want to see a print uh, of the hoop? Do I want to see the hoop being reflected? Um, do you, want, do you want to print in one page? If you print in one page, it may not be the actual size. If you're making templates, this should really should be checked. You want it at 100% of the normal size. You do not want it scaled. Um, if you don't want to see the jump stitches, which for a template I don't necessarily need to see, that being unchecked is uh, probably a good idea. So um, that is a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and close it here. That's a little bit about print setup. Um, going further down here, um, this is actually um, the page to close and open my properties window. So you see you've got your properties window here, and this is your sequencer view. So if I click off of that, you see how the properties went away. And sometimes you want to do that, especially if you have an object with lots of parts and you're trying to resequence things. This just gives you a little bit more real estate to work with as opposed to this, which is the more common way that we're seeing the program being set up. They did make a couple of new changes to the, um, to the Floriani software with this last update. And one of them is uh, to get rid of this close icon. Uh, what they felt, and I, I appreciate what they're saying, is that sometimes uh, people in their um, um, desire to keep up in class with things will come up here and click that closed, and then they, or they might even click this closed, and now they are trying to desperately get those things back up on the screen so they can continue with the class. So if I click on the, um, on the properties here, uh, that brings that window up. And then when I want to get my sequencer back, let's go ahead and see if we can find that. So I'm going to hunt for this for a little bit. Uh, let's see. So this would be under um, ch -ch 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 preferences. So if the, um, again, the, the um, sequencer is closed, you'd come up to toolbars. And then down here where it says Sequence View, if you'll click on that, that will bring that back as well. Just so you're aware, there's a little thumbtack right next to the Close icon. If you hit the thumbtack, it auto-hides it, so it's uh, it's still, um, you can still get to it, but it's, um, how to say, um, it hides itself out of the way, which is kind of nice. And uh, if you brought that back down, it will, uh, come back to where you can can see that. So uh, if you hover over like here the library tab for instance as I'd mentioned that's where you get your designs. Uh, if I go into the browser this allows me to browse any of the various locations on my computer and if you notice uh, when I click on designs it is empty and that is because for you to bring open a design through the library you first have to select the the library and then go into um, 
your designs and I'm just going to select something at random here. So I've got April selected, April 2011. Now if I go over to the design tab, it will show me what designs are in that April tab. And if there's something that I like, like this one here, I would simply click on it, drag it over to the window, and that sets it down so I can work with that. So that's uh, a, nice, a nice feature. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, we'll close that back uh, back down out of the way. Oops. Let's close that out of the way. And I'm going to come back here and didn't want to close it, close it. I just want to bring the tab back to where it should be. So just remember that uh, the toolbars, this is how you can bring these tabs back if you don't see them uh, anymore. So um, continuing to work through, you'll see um, this next page is my, um, my program preferences. And this is an important screen. Uh, there's a couple of new things here in the latest update um, where you have like default style, I say is normal. You could say, um, for instance, that I am digitizing or creating like uh, on a quilted fabric or a sheer or a silk or I could, you know, handbag, fleece. This will change um, some of the defaults for the compensation, um, um, for push-pull, those types of things. So a lot of different fabric types, et cetera. Normal is the, the default, uh, but I do want you to know that you can change the fabric type there. The machine format, it really depends on, on your machine, of course. So if you're a baby lock, uh, brother, pipe person, it's Pez. And if you are a uh, owner of a Bernina machine, EXP, um, my Janome people, you're going to be Jeff. Jeff, if you are a Viking, who's going to be a Viking, a VP3 is your cup of tea. Um, notice that this is a new function. I like this. I wish more people, more of the software companies would have this. It's auto save in your editing format. Walter Augustus Floriani is what that stands for. And what will happen is if I saved this rose, it would save it as a PES and also as a WAF so that if I had to do further editing, that format would be there. Uh, things like the hoop bracket location, majority of the time they are on the left. If you're using um, uh, other types of machines like Janome, they're oftentimes at the top of the hoop, etc. So that's what that bracket thing is all about. The environment, um, this is where when you load up your um, software, uh, it will default to a unit of measurement, in this case the metric, which I'm okay with. Remember, if you wanted to change this back to an imperial, you would just go up to the ruler here, right click on it, and then select uh, inches or imperial. Uh, Autosave every five minutes, probably a good idea. If your software crashes, you can get a backup of your um, of what you were creating. Uh, image editing program, MS Paint is what comes standard with your, uh, your software. Uh, if you are um, an owner of, uh, say, Adobe Illustrator or Corel, you could also link to that program uh, and you would use that there. And then when you go to edit the image using one of the wizards, which we'll cover, um, that program would open. I'm going to leave it at MS Paint because if you're on Windows, we all have MS Paint. And language, um, if you can understand this um, video, this is probably a good place for you to be, but there are other uh, languages. It's interesting, Czech being one of them. Okay. Um, show, warning for lar um, show warning for large satin stitches is if you're digitizing and your column is greater than nine millimeters, it will say this is a little too big for what you're trying to uh, accomplish. The navigator, you may recall, that's that optional window that will pop up and it will show us when we're zoomed in where we are in the grand scheme of things. And it's very easy to navigate at a specific zoom level to where we are at. I'll show the navigator uh, as we um, move forward with this. But this would, every time you start up your software, it would, in essence, have that window open. I elect to not have that up because the window does take real estate as well. Um, going further, this is kind of important here, the highlight selection. I'm used to my software 
giving me, um, um, when I select something, having it into a pink color. And um, it defaults to a blue color. And if this is the uh, only software program you own and, and you're used to, and you're not used to anything different, then leave it at blue. But you can select here and you could select a specific color chip. These are kind of presets. Or if you click more, you can say, well, no, I want this to be, I don't know, this color of uh, pinkish. And you might say, I want to make it custom, which now I could take the slider and slide this up or down to get a specific color for that. Um, selection and so what do I mean by that let me just X out of here and show so again when I selected a piece do you see how it turns uh, this pink color um, that's a great thing while I'm at it I'm just going to show you if I again if I zoomed in oh crap I don't I don't see my object remember I had selected it how do I know it's selected do you see in the sequencer how all of this is blue in color that's how I can tell things are selected so an easy way to find out where my object went to is if I come up here and I say zoom to selected and it will bring that back up. Again, um, uh, we have a scroll wheel on our mouse that allows me to zoom. And so long as the object is right on the center of the page, this works beautifully. The issue is when something's not on the center of the page and then when you try to scroll into it, you see how it goes off to the side? This software at this point will only scroll, scroll to the center origin. And I have put in a request to get them to update that feature. I really want to zoom in wherever my mouse is. And many other software programs work that way. And I'm sure uh, FTCU and PEP are going to make that a feature. They're very responsive to, uh, to people's requests. Um, but the navigator, if I go under view and then come down to navigator, this opens up this little window here. And if I'm zoomed in, do you see how this window, like this, this little red box, this is where my window is currently. And if I click this and drag this over, do you see how I can come up to my, my embroidery and if I want to go to the bottom of it I can come here and now I'm at the bottom of it so I do like that I can change my zoom factor by doing this so you see how the box gets bigger and it gets smaller yeah this thing in the background by the way let me come back out this is just showing you the hoop it's invisible to us now because we have it turned off I'm going to go ahead and X out of that um, so that's the navigator. Let's go back into our um, um, ch -ch 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 our preferences, which again, we can get to it from here, which is tools, preferences. And we can also get to it once again by this guy here. That was my preferences icon as well. And so uh, that was view. We talked about this. The show crosshair in input mode. Um, this I think is new to the software too. Notice if I if I put this on input mode and I say OK, and then I select a tool, um, and let's say I'm going to come up and oh, select something. I had to stop the video because I was missing all of these tools. Let me show you what I did behind the scenes besides uh, taking a deep breath. is If I go under toolbars, you see where it says design? If I unselect that, do you see how that's magically disappeared? So if you're missing icons, guys, go back to your toolbar. Just make sure that things are turned on. Um, it'll happen to you. So um, if I go into an input mode, and let's just say I'm going to be um, going into creating um, like a run stitch. Do you see how I've got this uh, cursor and I've got, it looks like a crosshair, this, these dotted crosshairs. That's, you know, it's, it's an interesting um, view. This, for some people, might be distracting. So if I come up here, let me just go back to my, uh, I'm going to delete that because I don't need that. I'm going to go back up to my, um, my preferences and go into digitizing, I'm sorry, view, and show crosshair in input mode. Let me deselect that, say OK. And now when I am once again into my mode, do you see how I'm now creating, but I don't have that big crosshair there. So 
if, if you don't want it, if you don't want it, um, you can turn it off, which which is nice. I could see the use for it, um, but I'm going to have it off now because I find it distracting. Notice I'm setting down all of these points. This is one way you can input things. If I, I'm just left clicking here, and if I if I hold down the uh, the shift key and click, um, that's not doing anything for me. If I hold down the control key, it's going to give me curves. So see, I got curves. And once I right click, I'm going to right click now. That's what sets down the object. And it's a Picasso type of object. If I want to select the last object I drew, I come up to the select tool, which is here, select it, and then I can delete that out of there. Um, coming further down here, this, um, when I click on here, this brings me to the Floriani page. This was the, my Floriani club. Remember, we can also get it to that uh, what's new page that I showed at the beginning of the video. And you'd put in your email and your password, and that's how you would get that. Um, this is your stitch player. And I would generally leave that on. It's right here. What this does for us, which is nice, is it will allow us to play back the stitches. Notice it's separated by the colors. I can do this manually as you're seeing here and I can also hit the fast forward and that will let it auto play. I could take this and speed it up or slow it down. I can pause it. I can make it play um, backward by one step, forward by one step, play in reverse. It's a nice player. And again, I always uh, try to always do a um, slow redraw just to see that pathing and things are, 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 are nice. Um, this is when we want to do a, um, a save to sew. And a save to sew, it's going to ask us a bunch of questions as far as when we save the object, what kind of fabric, etc. Let, let me show you what I mean. If I if I click on this, it's going to say, all right, the type of fabric, uh, maybe a baby onesie. No, maybe I'm going to do this on canvas. And it's going to ask, did you digitize it or was this like a stock design? So in this case, it was a stock design. It was something I pulled in from the software. I myself did not digitize it. And I'll click here. It will also ask, do you want me to... Um, um, change things like the um, uh, the density for the canvas, for instance, or apply a different underlay, etc. And if you want those settings, and I would turn those on because it gives you a better stitch out for the fabric, you can absolutely um, do that as, as well. And convert to outlines will actually let it show in stitches, which is nice. When I click next, I uh, get a step-by-step um, -step kind of tutorial with how I uh, should s embroider this out. This is fabulous. So uh, step one, step two, step three. So fuse the stabilizer. What kind of stabilizer? You know, stitch and wash fusible. How do you hoop it? And then uh, do you put a topper on it, etc. And special instructions. And then when I click finish, it would go ahead and save the design with the new underlay, with the new density changes for the canvas, etc. So uh, nice feature. These tools here, these are your auto um, digit, not auto, excuse me, manual digitizing tools. And so I think the best thing to do here is I'm going to go ahead and select this design that is currently here. And we're going to go ahead and delete, um, delete this off of the page so we can take a look at each of these tools in succession. So this first one, this is actually going to be my line input. And notice it's talking about inputting artwork points. This is not stitches. So if you look up here, it says stitches. There are no stitches. When I click on this tool and I begin to set down points, just as we would do with one of these manual digitizing tools, I'm left clicking. And now I'm going to hold down the um, control key and click. And now I'm getting curved nodes. It's doing exactly what we expect. When I hit a uh, right click, it is now set the object down. This, when you look in your sequence view, you're going to see it is called 
artwork. Artwork. It is not stitches. If you notice up here, there are no stitches here. So this is when you are in, uh, initially creating the artwork, which will eventually perhaps be turned into stitches. Or you could save this as uh, an SVG file, I do believe. Let's see. So if we go File, and if I say uh, Export Image, nope, that won't let me save it that way. Um, I'm sorry, export artwork, of course, export artwork, SVG file. This is magical for those of you that own a uh, silhouette or brother scan and cut, those types of things, because what I've just done is I've given the cutter instructions on how I need to cut out. Maybe this is fabric for an applique. Maybe this is a, a cutout of uh, decorative paper, et cetera, et cetera. So you can save that, which is nice. Now. I had mentioned earlier um, about these various tools and I talked about being able to create a closed object. And so this currently is an open object. And if I come over here, which is my properties for this object, notice that it says pen width of zero. I can make that pen width a little thicker, say maybe one millimeter, or, yeah, one millimeter. Click apply, that thickens up the line. If I click fill and then apply, do you see how it's taken this and it has closed the shape for me, which is kind of nice. I'm gonna go ahead and undo that. I'm gonna also come over here to the reshape object tool. So here's my reshape object. And what I have now are these different nodes. And I can take hold of this node, pull this node around here come off of it, it's just a reshape thing, and then if I say here, close the object, do you see how it has closed the object for me here? And then I could come over here and apply a fill. Again, not stitches, artwork. I could certainly turn the artwork into stitches by using these one-click wonders here. From here on over, these are all fills. And from here over, these are all for outline types of stitches. We'll talk about that more when we get to the bottom of the page. So um, that is how you can create artwork. I'm going to go ahead and delete that uh, beautiful image. And how you can delete very easily is just exit out. Like that, those new tools. This is manual stitches. And in manual stitches, it's where I put a stitch is where it's gonna, the needle's going to hit. So do you see how, as I'm coming further out, it's saying like 2.3, 7, you know, 3.5, etc. If I want like a basting length. Got to be careful with your, um, your length. If you're putting them way out like this, the machines will sometimes not allow you to stitch that out because it's too far of a jump for it to make. But these are just placing for manual stitches. Um, and why you would do that is when you wanted to have specific stitch links between like objects. Lettering comes to mind um, where I want to embed the connection stitch, like say with a terry towel, something of that nature. Once again, if I right click, it sets the object um, and that's that tool. I'm gonna go ahead and select that object and we'll go ahead and delete that as well. Moving further down, this is gonna be a um, my, my running stitch. So whereas this was artwork, this is stitches. So when I click on this, notice that it's saying the type of object I'm going to create is a single run. It could be a double run, bean, motif, needle, uh, up, blah, blah, blah. So uh, I'm going to just do it as a single run. And because I can, I'm going to make my stitch length a three. And when I click apply, it is applied. And when I click on this, I am now creating objects. Notice they, like the stitch, the length here is saying 24.0. That is not needle point penetration separation because remember the needle stitch length is still set at three. This is just setting the nodes at this point. Whereas when I was in the manual tool uh, mode, when I click, those are this, where the stitches are going to occur. 
so it's a little um, different concept and I can stop the video if you guys are wondering what I'm talking about. Um, so again, same story, if, if I'm going to hold down the control key, I now get curved, curved points. Okay. When I right click, that lets it go. So that's how I create different types of run stitches or, or single path type stitches. We'll go ahead and click on that, delete that. Let's go to the next, uh, the next object. This is um, actually, this is kind of a, a cool way of creating uh, satin objects. And when you use this tool, you're going to get um, a dialog down here that you need to uh, be aware of. It's going to kind of give you, um, how to say, helpful hints. Um, and so I'm thinking probably the best way to illustrate this is if I had a piece of artwork to, um, to use the tool on um, so you can see what I'm doing. So I'm going to pause the video long enough to get something up here for us to use. One moment. So what I needed to do is bring up a piece of artwork and um, I wanted to use it as a backdrop for this tool. So let me show you how I did this. If you go over to the um, backdrop tool and you click on it, it will actually bring up a, um, a dialogue that will allow you to um, open. Let me get a new piece, piece of paper so you can see. If I click on this, it brings me up this open dialogue. It wasn't allowing me to do it just then because I already have a piece of artwork up. You would navigate to where your artwork is and understand that this can be either bitmap or raster images or vector images. Uh, so they're, they're not just raster or vector, it's a combination. You would navigate to where you have your image, you would click open and um, it, would, it would bring it up. So I'm gonna close that and bring this back up. Prior to this update that we just got with Floriani, this is how your backdrop would, would look. It would be projected on top of the grid so you do not see the grid lines uh, above it. And for a lot of the work, that's not uh, a bad thing, but for some of the work, especially when you're trying to use guidelines, this is, um, it's better to have the grid below it. So what you can do in our software now is if you go under um, your preferences, and if you click on view, we have this new tool here, show backdrop below the grid. So see how the backdrop is now. I'm going to click on show backdrop below grid, say OK, and now we see the grid above um, it, so the artwork is behind it. So I'm going to once again select this tool here. This is how we can um, digitize a, um, an object. And so um, when I click on this, let's say I wanted to digitize this, this little wing here. So what I can do is um, it'll say enter enter satin path. So you enter satin path uh, points. So I'm going to go ahead and um, start saying digitizing um, maybe this little piece here. So I'm going to come here and it's going to be a combination of a left click um, and then I'm going to hold down the control, right click, and I'm just going to do this fairly quickly but you'll see this guy here and then um, come back around this way. So I'm just kind of outlining this little piece, something along that line. And when I right click, I get another um, text box that says enter inclination lines. And uh, believe it or not, there's a little black dot connected to my cursor. And that is just telling me that I can tell the software now that I want like an inclination line here and maybe one here. And then when I right click, it's going to say, tell me where you want it to start. And I'm going to say, I want you to start, maybe I want it to start here. And then it says, tell me where you want it to exit. And I'm going to say, exit here. And then once that is done, lo and behold, uh, let me get to my zoom tool. Um, and just kind of come here. It has created, let's show this in 3D it has created the satin object. And if I wanted to, um, let's just 
take a look here too. Sorry. Go back out just a bit. And yeah, you can see here's the satin object. And so it's a nice quick way. I'm, I'm just kind of outlining the shape here and then telling it where the inclination lines are, where the start is, where the stop is, and it creates the object. I'm going to go ahead and delete that. And now I'll show you how this other tool works. This is how uh, many of the software programs define satin objects, and that's why they call it a classic satin stitch. So what I'll do is I'll click on this tool, and again, I will begin, as we did before, clicking on various points here. But if you notice, with this tool, it's kind of a left side, right side type of motion. So just watch watch as I do. And um, let me just... So it's just going to be a left click, left click. And if something has a curve, remember you can put in right inclination points. Each time I make these clicks, I'm setting down how I want the satin lines to follow as well. The inclinations at least. And that was just um, that Amazon Alexa thing, thinking I was talking to it. See what I mean? Alrighty. And then we're just going to finish up with two more clicks and then right click to end and here we've created the object as well. So two ways of, uh, two tools to um, create satin stitches. Um, uh, very, very nice. Uh, and um, you know how I do like the manual tools. They are a little more work at the beginning, but they save you a lot of editing when you use, uh, as opposed to the auto tools. So the next tool I'm going to show is actually the steel stitch. And when you think of a steel stitch, think of it as a, um, an outline stitch. It is a satin column. So um, this is a little uh, bitmap, raster image, I should say, of, um, um, of Chris Kringle. And what I'll do is I'm going to first just click on this. And you can see the width that it's being defined at is 2.5. Um, if I was using the tool, you know, again, left clicks versus uh, control clicks, giving me curves, um, and then right click to set. This is the thickness that this line would give. Um, this is my uh, current backdrop, and I could certainly zoom in um, further to uh, make it fit. I can also take this and like maybe say I want the width instead of being 2.5, I'm going to make this relatively narrow and uh, like about a 1.4 uh, and we're going to apply that and so now as I create uh, a very similar um, pattern here and right click you can see the difference in the thicknesses between the lines so this is a very good thing to use if you're if you're outlining things um, in essence so um, the next tool Let's go ahead and delete these guys out. The next tool is my complex fill. And a complex fill, as opposed to a satin stitch, is going to be um, uh, not a satin. So how I use this tool, again, with a series of left and right clicks, let's just say I'm going to um, digitize this particular whisker. And so I'm going to start here, and it's again a series of left and uh, control clicks to get curved and straight nodes. Now in that I want this to be a closed object, what I can do is come over here, this is my close object tool, click on that and that will indeed close the object for me. As we're looking at this, let's select that it is now pink in color that may not be the color that I want so I can come over here and um, and click and turn it to whatever color I would like that particular fill to be um, 
The next tool, let me go ahead and select this, get this out of here. Uh, the next tool is, this is my applique or appla stitch uh, tool. And um, the thing that's kind of cool about this is um, it will automatically make something in applique. So if I wanted the same piece now to be an applique piece, again, a series of uh, sharp and curved nodes. And I can certainly hit um, right click to enter this. And then if I select it, I'm just showing another way to close the object, I can hit close like so. So that's just another way of doing that function over here. The, um, the stitch is a little wide, so I might want to bring this down to uh, maybe a 1.8. That's looking better there. The density is fine. The inset, that's how close it gets to the fabric. I would want a so line, a so placement, a so tack down, and a finish. If I wanted to put fabric in here, there is a little icon here. And when I click on this, I can select a fabric and put him in there. I will be doing a class on applique and we'll go into this with much greater detail. If I wanted to see a slow redraw of this, let me first hide the, uh, the backdrop Im drop image. And to do that, I come down to here and when I click the backdrop goes away and you will see that the first thing that happens is we have the um, the placement line then we have our cutting line and then we have our decorative stitch over the top and that's how you would create an applique. I'm going to bring the backdrop back in so we can see and the next tool on over, um, this is um, actually a, um, an auto shape tool uh, in essence. Let me hide that backdrop. Um, what I mean by auto shape is there's specific shapes that you can use, like here's my square. So if you ever were in class and you have to draw a rectangle, that's how you would do a rectangle. If you needed to draw, say, a square, same scenario, you would though hold down the control key and that would give you a perfect square. If you wanted to say you were in class and you needed to do a uh, circle, hold down the control, draw your circle. Uh, again, if I wanted to change the color, left click on the color chip to change the color and you can see it's updated here. So in addition to those shapes, which are illustrated here, there's also these custom shapes and people will sometimes forget that this exists. Um, these are very nice starting off points for a lot of different things. So if, say for instance, I have this little uh, bird here. I can click on the bird to select him. Here is my bird. I can absolutely um, uh, transform or change the size. If I don't capiche the metric, I can go to inches. That's a pretty good size for that. Um, and I could take this and with my one click wonder turn this artwork, because this, that's what this is, there's no stitches, it's just artwork, but turn it into applique. I wouldn't be doing this with the manual tool. I would come down here where it says applique and click here. Automatically with one step, we have done the exact same thing I did manually. Um, and so again, we have our placement, our cutting line, and our decorative stitch so it doesn't get too much easier than that that that's pretty nice perfect alrighty so let's delete these objects off of here uh, working further down these by the way these, these are buttonholes so I can create buttonholes of various lengths and if I wanted to I could change what type like maybe I want to create rounded buttonholes for instance let me go and sorry select select the buttonhole and say I would like you to be a 
rounded end buttonhole apply and you can see that that has updated so very nice if you had say a um a pattern um a blouse and you needed to have buttonholes uh, placed and using a longer hoop um, you could absolutely automatically make your buttonholes and that is a one-step buttonhole on turbo charge uh, next uh, these are predefined like little embroidery designs is how I look at this and so you can see that there is uh, a nice collection of various and sundry images so say for instance I wanted these little scales all I need to do is left click hold drag to whatever size and voila I have now created an embroidery design with all of the different parts and satin stitches etc so it's kind of like uh, think of that as a little um, embroidery design collection there those are stitches as opposed to the auto shape tools like the bird we just saw remember that was uh, artwork that that was artwork um, these two tools here these are auto tools and this first one finds um, fill areas and the second one found, finds outline areas let me show you what I mean I'm going to turn back on that backdrop let's go ahead and zoom in on um, Santa and the first thing I want to show is how I can with one click create this shape which is his cap and we'll kind of look at the sequence of you as these things are being created so I'm going to click on the tool and when I click here this has now created the object um, if I wanted to I could have that object selected this gives me the properties of this I'm going to beef up that outline a little bit so we can see uh, that's too much and I could say instead of it being um, this blue color this uh, yeah, Copen uh, I can come over here if you see where my cursor is down here and I could say let's make that red in color and here's a nice red and if I say let's make this a fill as well apply here I have a beautiful piece of what what everyone say together it is artwork are there any stitches no there are no stitches how can I make this into stitches I can turn to my one click wonders and down here remember from here on over these are fills and I can say make this a complex fill and we've talked about uh, how we can change patterns here etc from standard to them to embossed and fancy and things of this nature we'll just click apply and we have his little hat here the other tool this tool here finds outlines and so when I click on him as opposed to the fill tool when I click on an outline object you see how it found all of the outlines of similar color and it has created them um, in this case as a run stitch so the first creates the artwork this is actually going to create a run stitch for you and if you click on the run stitch you can of course change it from like a bean stitch to whatever you would like it to be so those are auto tools that's kind of nice and uh, let's go ahead and we'll select everything and, um, and delete and hide the little backdrop <clears throat> this guy here this is to fit into hoop let me show you what I mean up till now we have not been looking at hoops but you could certainly turn on your hoop so you could see what you were looking at by selecting this icon here and this shows me the hoop this may not be the hoop that I'm interested in so I could select the icon right below it where I can say I would like a um, a hoop that's maybe five by five by seven um, type of hoop and I would like it to be not rotated but in this I, I can rotate by 90 degrees here if I wanted to and I'm gonna say okay that's fine so there's a 5 by 7 hoop I can now bring in a piece of artwork and so or excuse me a design a design so I'm gonna say open we'll just grab this flower again and I want to go ahead and once again see my hoop and so you can see that the design is there I can select my design I can resize it so 
so that it no longer fits into the hoop. And what I can do now with this, you see it's now active, I can click once and it will fit this into the hoop. Conversely, if this design, let me just get it back to, um, I'm going to delete that and just bring it in again. So if that design was a little too small, I could say fit into hoop and it will recalculate the stitches to fit it into the hoop. Love that. that that's a, a nice feature. These last two icons I'm going to actually talk about in class uh, more so to shorten up this video a bit. But this is how we can add names to uh, things and, and this is a, a hoop function that I won't get into at this point. So uh, let me just get a new sheet of paper. This lower row here, um, these have to do with text. And so if I click on uh, the T uh, for text, I can say I want it to be line text, art text, hotel script, or fit to a path. And so if I click on the T, and you see how there's a, an A now attached to my um, cursor. When I click on it, it brings open this dialog. One of the new things with the um, software that I um, do, do appreciate is they have things defined by the type of stitch. So like these are appliques, APs for instance, these are micro designs, it's 60 weight thread is what that stands for. These are block fonts, BL, uh, and these are scripts, etc. SC. And Whereas I loved how they did that, and I love how you get like a little preview here. Uh, if I just wanted to say, see all of my applique designs, what's new is up here, instead of saying all fonts, I can say, I would like to see all of the applique designs. And now when I click on this, only the applique designs are apparent. If I come here now and say, I really want to see only all the handwritten designs, now what I have is, you can see it's a filter, so all of my handwritten designs are now um, apparent. And I can click on, say, Jello. I can say, um, uh, I like um, uh, Pep. And when I click on Apply, those settings are applied to my text. And when I click off, I have the, the letterings like so. So that's how you can put in letterings and you can actually reshape and do things with that. But this again is just an overview class and I'm, I'm going to move on. So um, let's go ahead and not put in another object there, delete those out. This next object, this has to deal with monogramming. And so when I uh, do a single click, what I have here is this dialog where I can put in the letters that I want, the height, and this is like what kind of monograms. You see how some of them have frames, like decorative frames, and some of them do not. So if I wanted to, oh, like maybe this guy here would be fine. And so for the decor or the little fancy things, what I can do is say, well, I would like maybe, I don't know, a decor that looks kind of like this, for instance. And if ABC is fine, I'm going to say apply. And as you can see, I have now created for our viewing pleasure a, uh, an, uh, a monogram in one step. The, um, the true type fonts, this is, this is relatively new and there are videos on the Floriani website that uh, will go through this but it would take me an additional uh, 20 minutes to go over this function alone so I just want you to know it's there. What I can do is I can bring in a new font uh, like as a BX file or any of these fonts that you can get online that are stitch files. Not We're not talking um, how to say um, um, art files. These are stitched files and in essence what I can do is map all of the different letters out and what will happen then is I can type on my keyboard and those particular letters will be put down. We will absolutely do a class on that. I think that's an excellent uh, function they have. This is how I deal with my uh, importing true type fonts and these fonts live in your operating system. So depending on your operating um, system, your mileage will vary. Uh, and if I say okay to big band chords, uh, 
and I'm going to say these are big band chords and I'm going to stop the video now because we got a little phone call. So we have again this uh, big band chords thing and when I say OK it has um, an essence brought in these guys as artwork. So you can see artwork, 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 blah, blah. So if I wanted to, I could absolutely go into uh, each of these, like the, the big, for instance, and use something like um, um, a turning angle satin, for instance. Um, and if I wanted it to be the same color as um, as the green that, that, that we're seeing here, um, change that to the green like so. And if I wanted the rest of these um, of the same ilk, what I could do is select the first, holding down the shift key, selecting the last, and once again, putting that as this turning angle satin. Um, and you will see now that you have created um, a font. Um, one of the benefits of the true type fonts is when I'm going to reshape, I have more control points. Uh, and we will get into more of that with future adventures together. I am looking forward. So uh, the next uh, icon here, uh, where it has like the capital F, this is uh, font play. And uh, in font play, I can, uh, this I believe is a new feature. So it has, let me just kind of take a look here. Uh, this is if I was selecting, um, this is a way of, I, I believe, previewing the fonts. I'm going to learn more about this, I'm sure, as we go uh, forward, too. So I've got all of my embroidery fonts, or I could, in turn, ask for it to show me all of the true type fonts. Um, this, of course, just being a placeholder for the lettering. Um, all fonts, color, default, lettering, custom, etc. Print preview setting. And I can, I presume, print up and import these. So uh, we'll get into that as soon as I learn what I'm doing with that as well. Uh, let me get a new sheet of paper here going further down this way. This is, um, th these are vector artworks, so uh, custom shapes. So when I click on this, we saw this, by the way, um, up here when we were um, clicking on this and we went to custom shapes. That's just another way of getting to this same screen. So I'm coming back over here. I'll click custom shapes. Understand that in addition to custom shapes, you also have easy art. And so in easy art, you've got things like letters. Would these be nice to create as applique with an SVG file? Everyone say yes. So you can use your cutters. Uh, but all of these little guys here are just, in essence, pieces of artwork. Okay. And I could absolutely use like the automatic tools and stuff to create um, to create what I needed to create with these. Um, further down here, this is actually your backdrops library. Let me get rid of this for now. And your backdrops library, these are your JPEG images. So if I wanted to bring this in as a backdrop, I have now done so. And if I wanted to hide it, once again, it's this tool here. I get there the same way by uh, clicking on the backdrop tool. And you can see we have the backdrop here. And now I've got resizing handle, so I can scale this to the size that I want. Remember that this is backdrops. However, uh, in this case, this is a, um, a bitmap. So be careful with how big you make things because you will get pixelation. Um, the next tool, let's um, go ahead and uh, hide that. The next tool, this is my artwork tool. And in the artwork tool, you'll see that we are now dealing with vector images, uh, Adobe Illustrator, um, EMF, WMF, etc. Um, careful with things like the Adobe Illustrator. Uh, I said it in the last uh, webinar. If you're dealing with the Adobe software itself, they might be, I think, on version 9. This can read up to like maybe a version 7. So you just need to be cognizant if you are saving things, like you have um, Adobe Illustrator and you're saving 
things as AI files. If you are not seeing it, you need to downgrade the version of it. Go to a lower version so the software can see this. But I use this as my for, for my backdrops. Um, these are my wizards. We had a class on the wizards. Absolutely. And so you'll just recall that what I have here is I can turn images into cross stitch. I can do photo photos and turn them into stitches. These are turning um, uh, vector shapes, etc., images into sorry, uh, yeah, artwork vectors or bitmaps into stitches automatically. So again, if I select image versus acquire, acquire means I'm going to use the scanner and scan it in. Select an image. I'll just select an image. Click open. Say next. It's going to ask me, do I want to resize it? We'll say yes um, or no. And just go forward. It's sh these showing me what colors we have here. We can edit the image. Remember that brings me up the um, the word MS Paint. Uh, and we did a class um, a couple months back uh, regarding processing. I think it was this image itself. Uh, but we're just going to go next, next, next. Finish. And um, this, in essence, gives me this vectorized image. You know, here are my artworks, and now I can take this and turn this into, say, a fill, as you can see here. So that's that's that that first tool or third tool, I should say. Let me show you the um, the next tool. So I'm going to Control A, delete, and we're going to go back into our wizard. This time, we're going to be going into the guy with the magic wand here, wizard. This is to turn it into stitches. This is to turn raster images into vector images. This is to turn images into stitches. So same dialogue looks very similar. If you read here, it kind of reminds us what it's going to be doing. The uh, wizard helps you automatically create a design, i.e. stitches, from a file containing vectors or raster images. Uh, we're going to select the image. This will be fine. We'll say open. We're just going to next, next, next through this. And there you have stitches. And you can absolutely say, oh my god, that is the ladybug. And I think, you know, for auto processing, it did an okay job. We've, we've talked about this, but you can see like the eye is closed off and there's no stitches in there. It was white. Review the lesson. Review the um, uh, one we did um, and I'm sorry I don't remember what month it was, but it was earlier on. I'm thinking it was probably like November, December-ish. But uh, you'll you'll find you'll you'll find the um, the PDFs and everything that that we created for this. So let's get this out of here. <clears throat> Going further forward, this is duplication tools. These guys here. So what do I mean by a duplication tool? Let me go ahead and bring in a um, uh, a design. And I don't want that rose anymore. Uh, let me go into, um, I know what, let me go into our library. And we're going to just select this month, which is fine. And I want to look in the designs. That's beautiful. I'm going to go here. Yes, let's drag this over just to get something different. Isn't this cute, this little um, heart here? So what I would like to do is I don't want all this other jazz. I just want this little heart here. So what I can do is I can actually come in here and I can tell the software that I want you to ungroup, deselect, come in here now and I'm just going to select this one little heart here. How about? I'm going to go over to copy pay, and then uh, new page, paste. There's my one heart. Okay, so uh, it's a smaller image, and I wanted a smaller image. Let me turn this into 3D so we can see. If, by the way, we wanted to see how big this was, could we look at the uh, ruler and get an idea? Absolutely. But we also have this handy-dandy um, ruler here. So if I click on the ruler, this gives me the ruler tool. You can see it's connected to my little icon here. And if I want to know the width of this, I could left-click and drag. And this will tell me that this is 20 millimeters. If you, again, do not want it to be in uh, the metric unit, just right click on your uh, ruler, go to inches, go back to your little tool, measuring tool. And when you click and hold this time, you're gonna see that it is 0.78 inches. So it's nice to have things that are bilingual. I'm going back to metric. So what we wanna do with this, I wanna just kinda show you some of these tools here. These are kinda neat. These are uh, reflecting tools, 
if you will, to, um, and how about I just show. When I click on this, <clears throat> it's going to say, um, uh, welcome to the split look wizard, and this is not exactly what I thought it was going to be. This is to auto split designs. Um, I'm going to talk about this in a future class, but this is how we would split a design. It's not the reflection. Sorry. Uh, let's go to this. This is scatter. So scatter, in essence, let me get our hoop so we can see it. So here's my hoop. When I go to a scatter function, <clears throat> what this is going to say is based on the, um, the template size that I want. Uh, I might want this to be fitting more into the hoop, so it might be uh, 130 uh, in width and um, 180 in height, roughly a 5 by 7. And then I can say, of this design, of these designs, how do I want to randomize it? So they'll be um, 80, uh, down to 80% of the original size or a maximum of 140 percent of the size and spacing at least 10 millimeters and I do want to auto rotate it I do also want to color sort so I'm not switching colors a bazillion times and when I click apply and um, uh, okay it will in essence scatter these designs about the hoop uh, so that's a, a very 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 cool function I'm going to undo that we're going to reselect this this guy is kind of like a scattering, but it's more organized. And what I mean by that is now I'm going to say, of these hearts that are of the size that I've already put in, I would like, let's just say for argument's sake, three rows across and three rows down. And I want maybe um, in millimeters, maybe five millimeters separation uh, on the horizontal action axis and five millimeters in the vertical. And uh, when I click OK, it will in turn do this for me. So I've got the separation that I asked for and things of that nature. I'm going to undo that. Let's go back into the same tool. We'll select the shape, go back into the same tool. Um, and this time we're going to say 4 here, 4 here. Uh, I'm going to say, I don't know, 8 millimeter separation here options I want this uh, let's see uh, auto resequence by color yes offset every other by uh, and offset every row by so this as you can see this is, gives me like a preview and I could say let's do something like this and something like this and if I wanted to I could come here like flip every other horizontal flip every other vertical and when I say OK, it's now duplicated it that way. So it's kind of like a, again, I, I think of it as an organized scatter. Uh, we'll go ahead and undo that back to the original design. Um, this guy here, I think this is the reflecting tool. So with this, um, what I can say is, once again, uh, the horizontal distance. You can see we update here the vertical distance something along those lines. Uh, the angle, see how that works there. And um, we'll say OK. And so now we have created something along those lines. So that's kind of a reflection on the vertical and the horizontal axis. Uh, this guy here is a color wheel. And with the color wheel, I could, in essence, I've got um, just two colors here and this would not be the best example to show. So let me get another design that might be a little uh, a little more colorful and I want to grab just something quick here. So we're going to grab oh this little apple. Let me see what has some more colors. Two colors, two colors. Here's three colors. Let's just grab this kite. So I've got the kite here and there we've got a kite. There's three colors in there. We'll go ahead and select this, go back to the color tool. So I can say let's, you know, lighten it and you can see the colors change. Or I can darken it. I can change the tint. Let's say I want to um, bring it to the green. So now I've got it now kind of in the green family 
step back. If I don't like what I do, this is kind of like an undo. This is a redo. I can randomize. And every time I randomize, it just gives me different permutations. I'm just going to say OK because we can. And I've just recolorized the, uh, the object. It's kind of cool. This guy here, this is Mr. Potato Head. And in Mr. Potato Head, I will go over this more. This this actually comes in your software. It's the collection called Monsters. But what I have in essence is um, the ability to um, choose things uh, like bodies, for instance. Um, these are other collections that I have on my computer. And say I wanted that body. And now I have like left arms, for instance. If I wanted to, I could say I want to see heads. So these are things you could attach onto the heads, like a horn. You have to kind of go with it, you know what I mean? Uh, and then that's a head, uh, head right. If I wanted to see heads left, head left, and something similar. And you can just kind of build this up like Mr. Potato Head. It's kind of cool. Um, you can also, the randomizer allows you to play, and this is just kind of gives you different it just randomly generates things and if you see something that you go oh my god my grandkid would really like this one I just push stop and I'm saying okay and wow I just created an embroidery design could I go in here and edit and resize things and all that good stuff absolutely absolutely I like the concept just think of it again as uh, Mr. Potato Head and lots and lots of different um, designs lots and lots of different designs um, this guy here, this one is our uh, wordplay. We did a class on this. You may recall this is where we have a shape and they have predefined shapes and I can certainly go ahead and add my own shapes as well. You may recall we did the thing with the witch's boot and um, you populate it with uh, words like, I don't know, witches and broom and uh, magic. And you can tell it to um, uh, like what kind of fonts, etc., to use, and all this. And when you generate it, in essence, is going to put these words based on how big you've made them. I'm going to make them a little bit smaller so you can get some more permutations in there. Something like this. And when you say OK, lo and behold, you've got very cute design. This all stitches out. I turned mine into an applique. There's a sample out there at the shop that you can see. Very, very fun. Um, and I'm just going to pause here for just a second. So what I have before you are five objects that I created off screen. The reason why I did that is you would be able to figure this out, I am sure. And how I did this once again was by my artwork tool these are just these five shapes here. I just left click drag after selecting a shape to create this. Now you may recall these are artwork and if you didn't know these were uh, not artwork, ways that you can tell. Once again look up here, there are no stitches. And if you come down to your sequencer you're going to see artwork. In fact when you come here where it says all segments, you're going to see if you click down that the only option is artwork. If you had other things, and we'll see this, you know, if we create a fill here and this is a bean stitch and this is a run stitch, etc. When you click on show, um, instead of all segments, you might see artwork, you might see fill, you might see satin, etc., etc. I made each of these a different color. They are reflected here. Notice how there is no color being represented on this top row here. And the reason why is the only thing that populates here are threads actual stitches that have been turned uh, from the various colors. So if I click on say a given color it will actually show me the outline right here of the color that I selected and if I hover over that you'll see it'll say Isochora Polyester Copen 3600 just like we see up here. If I choose yet another you will see that in turn it has highlighted the color chip but again nothing is here until we turn something into stitches. So um, I want to show you these next two tools here, the auto sequencer and the color sort. And um, 
understand that when you hover over something, you may not see the pop-up menu come up right away. Like when I hop over here, line input, that's great. It, it kind of shows me this. So if I'm not seeing what something is, like the manual stitches, etc., sometimes what you need to do is you need to look down here. So you keep your eyes here, and I'm going to come up and just hover over one of the icons, and you'll see how it says sequence. Here it says optimize entry and exit. Here it says color sort. Here it says auto based. So in order for these tools to be active, see how they're kind of grayed out? Except for color sort, because there are colors here. They're grayed out because again, there's no stitches. So let's rectify this by turning things into stitches. So first thing I'm gonna do is we're going to click on this as an outline. It could absolutely, we could put a fill in this as well and say, make this a fill. But I'm gonna leave this as an outline for now. Again, I changed the thickness of the outline by coming up here. And you can see the line thickens up or let me just put it back to one. Generally, when you're bringing in artwork, you're not going to see it. it'll say 0, 0.0 here for millimeters because it's just kind of a placeholder. But if you need to see it um, a little bit uh, more, you can thicken up the line. That helps. I'm going to come down to the one click wonders, and here are the one click wonders. And I'm going to go ahead and click on the first one, which is the run. Notice as I click on the next one, it says like cut color blend satin. Here, if I click on not click but just hover, it says auto satin. Here it says radial satin, so there are different things you can do. I'm just going to click on run. That has now turned it into a stitch object. How do I know it stitches? Because there's 43 of them. And if I come over here and click on the plus sign, I see now it says run as opposed to artwork. And furthermore, if I come up to show segments, I now have the ability to sort by artwork. So if I only just want to see artwork, I would click here. Notice that the first object is now gone because it's no longer artwork, it's run stitches. If I come here and say, show me just the run stitches, only that is shown. And if I say, let's play with everything, let's do it. One of the things I appreciate about both PEP and the FTCU program is that in the sequencer, I can see both um, artwork and stitch files all at once. That's lovely. This this other um, drop down is just if I wanted to see only a specific color. While I'm here, you understand of course that this is the branching. So if there was more than one object here, if I click on the plus sign, I would see all the different things that make up this object. Furthermore, I have the little eyeball here. And if I click on this, look up here, when I click on this, it magically goes away. It's still there. It is just now out of view. I'm going to re-engage that. The other thing I can do is click on the lock function. And once I've clicked on the lock, I can't select this. I can't interact with this. I can certainly come back over here, select it, and unlock it. And just to um, refresh, we also have the lock function here. That's one of our close tools. I really like how they did that. That's that's pretty neat. So uh, good good on them. So um, so there's one object. If I wanted to see, by the way, like where are the start and stop points? How is this thing made? Uh, if I click on my reshape, do you see how this is my start? The green. My stop is here. It was originally both up on top here. So it starts, comes back around, stops. That kind of makes sense. Let me go ahead and I'm going to select the next object, which is this guy here. And I'm going to also turn this one into a run stitch. And I will click apply. So now that is run stitch. You can see it says run. And if I come here and I say just show me the run segments, now these two are being shown. What I'd like to see here is that there is a jump from here to here. Personally, I think it might be best if the jump was from here to here, shorter distance. So I could absolutely come up here, select the object, select my edit node tool, which is this here. Again, I got to it very quickly, just by here. 
And I could say, I know the start's going to be here, but I want the end point to be here. And when I select it again, let's try that again. I want the end point to be here and the start point to be there. That's better. And now you'll see that the jump is like so. So I can visually do that for each of the objects. I'm going to undo that. You'll see the jump stitches up here because I want to show you what this tool is allows me to do. Again, grayed out until I select something for it to work on. So I'm going to select these two objects. Now this is active. You see how it's colorful? And what this is going to do here is it is going to sequence for me. And so um, this would be what best to stitch out first. And this one here is to sequence your start stops. And so I'm going to click on this, one click, click off, and you can see it did what I just did before, move the stop point here to make a shorter run. So this will give you optimal sequencing. So the way things stitch out, like if I have an object here, and an object here, and an object here, it will find the shortest path to bring those together. And this resequences starts and stops. This guy here is a color sort. And color sort means, simply speaking, if you have um, more than one object to um, bring those um, color so you're not changing the thread as much. Do you notice how every time I click on new page I get another file up here. In fact I can go back to prior things that we've done. As you can see. Let me actually click back on this guy here because it was a small design and see if I can show you color sorting. So if I take this and I duplicate this, again one of my shortcut keys, click here, I've just duplicated this. So I have two of these objects here. And currently the way that this is going to stitch out, as you can see, is it's going to go one, two, three, four, and then one, two, three, four, repeating the sequence. And what I would really like it to do is color sort so that this makes more sense. So when I come up here and I hit color sort, now what we see, it reduced five color changes. Amen to that, sister. And now I'm just stitching out the objects in this order here. So that's fabulous. I'm going to go ahead and um, go back to where I had been with these objects here. So if I have um, the next one, I should say, let me go, I'm sorry, I'm flipping around here a bit. But if I have these two little objects here that I color sorted, this next tool is an auto based. So when I click on this, it just draws a basting box around these designs. So uh, the first thing that will stitch out, as you can see in the stitch player, is the basting box. And then it stitches out the design itself. Basting boxes are really neat when you're floating a design, like if this was on a towel or something like, like that. That's, uh, it's a nice way of doing that. These are registration marks that they have here. Alrighty. And then um, the next tool this guy here is very similar. Let me just undo. And I'm going to delete this object so we just have the one. And this one is now selected. Um, this tool is going to cop create another copy of what is selected. So when I click on this, what I've now done, whoops. I'm creating a lot of copies. Uh, let me delete, delete. Let's try this again. So I click on uh, create a, a copy and when I click here it will make another copy but notice how I can change the size of it, the rotation of it. Maybe I want something like that. So it's not the same as that duplicate tool. So remember I have the duplicate tool which is this guy here. This makes another copy, same orientation, same size, etc. The first tool, once again, if I click on that, gives me the opportunity now of rescaling the design. Let me undo and do that once more. What you're going to want to do when you use the tool is uh, left click, drag. Right. 
it's very similar to when we were using the clip art tool. Remember these clip arts? We've done this. It, it's very similar to this. Look how quick we can make designs. It's amazing. Okay. So uh, I'm actually going to keep this little leaf design um, because I can. And I want to go ahead and let's see do something like this. I want to keep this leaf design here so I'm going to lock it and hide it and then I'm going to take all of this control A, copy everything, delete look what's left. It's Yeah, so see what I mean? So it's nice to have these tools. Um, I'm going to take this and actually um, zoom to selection and zoom back out just a bit. I'm going to take this and make a couple of copies of this. So the um, best way to do that is, of course, ooh, here's a way to do that. Come back up here. We saw this before. And I'm going to make four copies across and just one deep. And apply. You'll see what we're going to get. And we're going to say OK to that. So there's my four copies, each one being selectable and movable. And what I'd like to first show you is I can take um, these and put these onto a template. So my template here, for instance, might be uh, uh, like for a v-neck, like on a shirt. These are like collars, if you can imagine that. And I could say, let's put it on a template like this and say OK. And lo and behold, this is now on this collar. I'm going to go ahead and undo that. That's what the templates are. This is, uh, let me select an, the design again. This is another type of template, but this is circular. And I could say I would like, I don't know, 12 copies of that. And I want to change the angle of it like so. And I want to, this will kind of rotate them. And then when I hit apply, they would be in a circle. We'll just delete that out because we don't need to do that. Um, this is, let me zoom in here a bit. And I'm going to grab this, bring this over here. And I'm going to zoom to selected. Here we are back out just a bit. And this is how I can make an echo around this. So let's say I want, why not, five ripples three millimeters between each ripple and when I click OK it will calculate this and voila I have my ripples. Think uh, think quilting here. That would be kind of cool. I'm going to undo that. If I have um, get rid of the hoop. If I have this object, let me zoom in here a bit, I could take it and flip this on the um, vertical axis or horizontal axis as well as the vertical. I could rotate the design once again this way. I can also rotate it like so. So this is like a 90 degrees. Like so this guy here, these are my uh, alignment tools. So let me back out and kind of get all of these guys selected here. And when I look at alignment, I could say, I want all of these lined up so that the bottoms are all in line. And they all came in line, which is nice. I could also specify what kind of distance do I want in between. You saw, let me undo that. See how they're unequal in distance? Well, I can take this, and now they're all equal in distance. And they do this by what are the furthest designs. So if it's here and here, it calculates how many designs there, and then equally spaces them apart. Nice. Um, I can further with this tool uh, take things and say if they were, let me deselect that, move these offline again. So I can take this alignment tool and say I want all of these selected, go into the alignment, and now I want to align all of the centers. So that aligned all of the centers of those designs. Um, this guy, these are my welds and my uh, trims. We've done this in other 
classes. This is to group and to ungroup. This is to combine and break apart. We'll talk more about this uh, in classes. Absolutely. I'm sorry that this video is longer than I anticipated, but it's it's good to have this for a reference, guys. So um, the other things that I do want to show you are on this side here. We know this is my select tool. This, I when I select this, I need to select by a box, but if I use this tool, I select this by drawing a lasso around things that I want. So, and if I right click, it selects those two things. So this is kind of, if I need to get in between objects, it's a really nice, nice way to do that. Uh, I'm going to go back to these little graphics here and let me select this and zoom into this to selection so it's there. I want to create this into some stitches so that we can see a couple of things. So let's go ahead and create this as just a running stitch once again. It's a single run. That is fine. So here is my object. If I want to, um, I can uh, color it like maybe a deep purple. Um, and what I might want to do is reshape this object, reshape it. It's unfortunate that I made it the same color as those guidelines. So let's choose another color just so we can see it a little bit different. So these are stitches. And if I have the object selected and go to my reshape tool, this is giving me the nodes that make up this object. And so right now these are all line nodes, which means as I move this, there is a line and a sharp angle that is created. Notice with my cursor, if I go next to a node, it turns uh, to mimic the node appearance, a blue dot. If I come over here, it shows me this is the stop point. If I come over here, the node changes, the cursor changes to a green dot. That's the beginning, that's the end. If I come to the line where there's no node, do you see how it looks like a dumbbell? And if I right click, I have the ability at this point to add a point. So I'm going to say add a point. This gives me a point. Currently it is set as a smooth node. How do I know this? Because it's curved. It's no longer angular like these nodes are. I also get these little control handles which allow me to define the shapes of these curves. So I can draw very interesting shapes relatively easy. I'm just going to undo this. Um, I want to take this, I'm going to right click on it, and I'm going to say I want to turn this from that smooth node to a line node. And when I've done this, I lost those little selection handles, and this is working just the same as any of these nodes are. Very little bit about reshaping, so bear with. So um, if I wanted to, um, and I do, I'm going to go ahead and select this object, and this object. Uh, is it um, stitches or artwork? It's going to be artwork. How do I know? Because it says artwork there. And with this selected once again and going into my reshape tool, just like I did with the stitches, I could grab hold of here, add points, move points, redefine this artwork. I'm going to go ahead and take this object. Instead of turning it into a run stitch, I'm going to actually come down and turn it into a fill. So here it is as a fill. And what I can do here is this will show me, in essence, the, the different stitches that are in this object. And let me just zoom in here a little bit. So these are showing me stitch points. If I wanted to further see the stitch points, you might see this little icon here show stitch points. These are all the stitch points that make up this. And I could certainly come in here with this and take individual stitch points and move them where I want this. Not the best example, but I just want you to know that it's not just outlines that you can manipulate as far as the stitch points or the nodes, but it's the actual stitch points themselves. So this is stitch points. These are the nodes or the anchors. They call it anchors in the software as opposed to nodes. Um, I could select a group of nodes and pull them out and the stitches will of course follow and I get something that is very bizarre but I'm entitled. So 
this guy here, this as um, uh, we already know is our zoom tool. It's also, if you click down here, remember anytime you see these black diamonds or triangles, there's a secondary tool and this is of course my pan tool. Again, how best to do this is with that navigator window that we had uh, talked about earlier in this class. Um, this is to um, bring in artwork and so um, these are your vector files and you could bring them in and turn those into stitches. Let's get back out of here. Um, this guy here is to bring in a backdrop. This is to get rid of the grid or to show the grid. Conversely this is to show a hoop or to hide a hoop. Select a hoop as we just saw. This is to show stitches. So if I have stitches in an object it will show me the stitch points or not as you can see. So this is kind of showing me a um, they call it true view in some softwares but this, I like to think of this as an editing view. Much easier to see those stitch points. This is more artsy. Same thing here. I'm just seeing the stitch points. I'm not seeing all of the graphics that represent the thread. It just makes it easier to see the stitch points. This is how I would close an object. Um, this is again my, my backdrop tool. The ghost is um, when I have objects that are hidden, uh, how how much I want them to be diminished in uh, view, the transparency, if you will, is defined um, by this. This would actually ghost the image out. Uh, we'll talk about that in the future. This is the backdrop tool, and the backdrop tool, we can either see the backdrop as such, which is color, which I do most of the times. Again, I mentioned to class a couple of times, it's best not to have this as pure white. It's very hard to see things. I suggest a light gray, and you could vary the value of the light gray here. You could add it to a, a slot, you know, um, your, your custom color to a slot. So if I take this here, and okay, I've got this guy here, and I want this guy here and say add to custom colors you'll see that is now the custom color for it. Um, if I wanted something say in a turquoise -y type of thing and I wanted it to be a little lighter see how it's updating here and then I could say um, add to custom colors and I've got another custom color and I could specify X number of custom colors so I could just go to that particular color say OK and the backdrop is uh, colored thusly. Um, if I wanted to, I could also come here and look at those in terms of fabric as a backdrop. I personally do not see a big advantage of doing that. I use it more for uh, showing it in uh, the applique, which we've talked about earlier on. This bottom section here, these are my colors. You'll see now that I have color chips up here. These are now representing, as I mentioned earlier, actual thread that is in the design. These are potential colors. These are again my one-click wonders here. Uh, we'll learn more about these as we work together. Notice how things are grayed out currently. It's because I don't have anything selected. Once something is selected, these are now active. And if I um, uh, click on say this and I go into something like this which is a color blending fill it allows me for instance with this to choose two different colors of whatever choice I would like and I could say apply and it makes these kind of fun coloring types of changes here um, density is not really big on that um, so if I wanted to uh, go in here with the gradient and say the gradient density is like such, I could actually make it more like uh, 0.4 apply, and you can see it's a lot denser with the color. So um, down here, we're gonna see whatever hoop has been selected, even if we don't see it visually on the screen. Remember, we turn it on, um, that's how we select, we turn it on here. but this will name the hoop for you. And again, this will show me like what segments are here, what might be selected. Uh, if I select something, you'll see one thing is selected at 64 stitches. If I have 
two objects selected, the total stitch count is 736 stitches, etc. So I am hoping that this has been of help, at least to give you an orientation of the wonders of the software that you have. Um, we will be going through uh, a lot of these tools in great detail over the months that I have the absolute pleasure of presenting for you. Uh, do keep this in your library. Review these, review these tools over and over and over again. Um, and we'll talk more about in detail of these as we proceed with our lesson. But this is to be an overview. And as you can see, even with an overview, there is a lot of things to to discuss. So I hope this has been helpful and I look forward to our next class together. Bye for now.